All right, bless the Lord. Good evening, Fellowship Church. How many of you like to make a joyful noise unto the Lord? God's throne is established in justice and righteousness, and he's enthroned on the praise of his people. It's interesting, you have to think about what that means. How many times in scripture the, the Lord prescribed praise to his people, he said, praise me, go out before the army and praise And I'll bring victory to you. Thank you, Father. And Lord, you're a God that, that does, you manifest yourself when we praise your name. You manifest yourself when we declare who you are. You're always there, Father, but you show up in a different way. When the knowledge of who you are comes forth from our hearts and through our lips. So, Father, we desire you to show up in, a, in that way tonight. Make yourself known in our hearts. Make yourself known to those around us. Let's all stand up. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Is the Lord good? <laughs> Bless the Lord. Thank you, Father. You are good. And I, tonight, uh, there's, there's kind of inclement weather out there. And that's okay. You know, we need the sun and we need the rain. And Jesus even acknowledged this in Matthew 5. And so we, we rejoice that we have rain to replenish the earth. We thank you, God, for the life that you're bringing forth right now. Hallelujah. Let's make a joyful noise. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy to receive glory. And worthy to receive honor, worthy to receive all our praise, all our praise today. Praise Him, praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him. Exalt his name forever. Come on, praise him. Praise him and lift him up. Praise him. Exalt his name forever. Let's lift up our hands and sing holy. Holy, 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 you are holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy to receive glory, you are worthy to receive honor. Worthy to receive all our heart praise today. Come on, praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him. Exalt His name forever. Come on, praise Him. 
praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him, exalt His name forever. Let's praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him. Exalt His name forever. Oh, praise Him. Oh, yeah, praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him. Exalt His name forever. Thank you, Father. And forever we praise the name of Jesus, the risen Lord, the holy Lord. The one who is holy and makes men holy. Thank you, God. Restore us and refresh us right now, Father. Soften in this holiday season. God, I, I thank you that we have time with our families. And, of course, uh, in spending that time with our families and with our traditions, we, we acknowledge you and everything that we do, Lord. But there's also so much trapping of this season, God, that honestly doesn't point to Jesus. And we get so busy at this time as well, Father. And I just pray right now you would restore us. Renew us, Father, every way that we have not honored you or we've, we've indulged in traditions that don't really point to Jesus, God. We just we confess those things. We ask you to ask you to restore our heart, keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And restore fresh vision right now, God. And we thank you. Thank you for that, Lord. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand. In all of you, yes, I stand, I stand in all of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in all of you. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words. You're too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? And who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. 
majesty and throne above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. Yes, I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Yes, I stand. I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Of you. Thank you, God. We stand in awe of you tonight. Your magnificence and your majesty being evident from what has been made and even exceeding and above those things that have been made. You're a God that holds the universe in the palm of your hand. And you hung the earth on nothing. And you, O oh God, have never left your creation. You have watched over it and watched over your word to see that it's fulfilled. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We give you all glory tonight. In Jesus' name. All right. On your way, and we're going to have a time of prayer. It's Brother Mark... Uh, you know, Mark, this is just kind of in my heart right now. You know, the highest expression of being a human being, I believe, being a Christian, is being a son. A son. And you know, one of the highest expressions of walking like Jesus is being an intercessor. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Amen. And he's high priest forever on the basis of an indestructible life. We can always come to him. I just, I just want to share that with you. I appreciate what you do. I know you pray a lot. Amen. We have to unmute back
We had a situation a few months back to where my daughter, April, came over to spend a couple of days taking care of my mom. And uh, she woke up one morning. Who did that? To find out that her vehicle had been taken. And the time we got it back, it was not worth repairing. But uh, we, we have made a, shall I say, substan substantial. Anyway, there was a a donation towards replacement of her vehicle, and I thank God for that, that we're getting that ball rolling. And she and uh, her daughter, my granddaughter Kayla, have been sharing Kayla's vehicle. Kayla graduated from the uh, University in Charlottesville this past spring, and she moved to an apartment with a, one of the girlfriends. Um, I call it the Lincoln, it's actually called Lincolnia, but it's, the Alexandria area, Duke Street goes over Shirley Highway 395. Duke Street turns into Little Road Return Pike, and that little neighborhood is Lincoln. So, so they've been sharing that vehicle. And Kayla, bless her little heart, going to see some friends at the college neighborhood for New Year's. So April has the car back for a few days, and thank you, Lord, for that. And we're gonna. Ask you, Lord, to lead us and guide us to just the right vehicle for April. Now, let's see. Oh, well, I want to open up the prayer list with Pastor Marvin himself. Give me a little feedback. Uh, he called me this afternoon. His daughter came in from Florida with a bit of a tummy ache. And it seems that he grabbed hold of it. And he's got a tummy ache, too. So he's not coming in this evening. And we're praying God's healing and whatever is the cause of the discomfort to be completely out of Marvin and his family. And Lord, we ask you, if we may, to make it so by the time they wake up tomorrow morning, give you honor and praise and glory. Thank you, Jesus. We will pray for Nancy Willis. We don't see her on the prayer list too much very often. And she doesn't do much complaining. But she's got a whole lot of issues that have been going on for years from going back, I forget how long it's been, over 20 years when she got hit by that bus. And she's had all kinds of operations, and so she's got back aches and joint aches and all that kind of thing. We just still love her on you, Nancy Willis, and we're praying God's continuing, God's continuing healing on your body, strength and comfort and encouragement. Uh, my own mom, to just touch slightly on details, mom's 91, bless her heart. Uh, my dad passed away eight years ago, so she's now the same age that he was when he went to glory. He was several years older than her. But uh, anyway, she, she has severe, uh, I always forget the word, dementia, severe dementia. And just about two weeks ago, she fell out on the kitchen floor and she went up to the Alexandria Hospital for three days. And through all the testings that they did, they found that she has cancer in her lungs and they're guessing that she may live something like another six months. Well, I'm not crying and saying, oh Lord, how can you let this lady get sick and die like this. My mom has had a wonderful life. She's 91 years old. She's had a full life. I, I could go on for some time tell you about what a wonderful mom, what a wonderful wife she was to dad, and all that kind of thing. So God has blessed her life. I just pray that God will keep her physically and emotionally comfortable and help we family members because we are not to leave her alone at all 24-7. Eyes on. And that can get difficult with family members trying to, uh, you know, work out schedules and that kind of thing. And Well, you know, people start pointing fingers that you haven't done what I, you ought to be doing, and I did all, all of that kind of stuff, you know. 
So we pray God's patience for we Pauluses. And we thank God for the blessing that my mom has been. And, you know, if it takes several months, if he keeps her on this ground on this earth, if it's God's will, if she stays another three years or so, it's God's business. But whatever it is, thank you, Jesus, that it be to your honor, your glory, and she not have miserable discomforts. We continue to pray for the Jude house. The pastor's been so faithful in going up there on Saturdays to minister there at the Jude house along with the, a few helpers. And uh, the Jude house is a rehab facility, drugs, alcohol, etc. And last I looked, it was a four-month program. And, and the time that we've been involved Fellowship Church has been several years, so a lot of men and women have come into the program, graduated the program, and gone back out. Some may have come back again. So, you know, my prayer is for all those who have come through that, that ministry and who, who are on their way, who are there now, and those who have graduated and moved on. I'm praying for deliverance. I'm praying for born-again souls that not only will they shake the, uh, the habits, and that's a, it is a bondage, drugs, alcohol, particularly, it is a bondage of the enemy, which I know firsthandedly. God delivered me many, many years ago from, well, drugs and alcohol, alcohol was my drug of choice. But God knew what had to be done for this individual. Thank you and praise you, Lord. So, um, you know, Pastor, He's not a 50-year-old man like he was when I met him. He needs more physical strength, Lord, encouragement, and he just never he just keeps on going like the ever-ready bunny on a commercial. We pray you uh, manifold return in your blessings to Pastor Marvin and his wife Donna, been involved in ministries for so many years. Uh, let's see. You know, I was driving... Marcus and I were driving over to the skating rink in Odenton today because we were having a school's out session. And I saw a big old sign on the side of the road. And I don't know if it was pertaining to the state of Maryland or the United States, but it showed that 107 and 81 people have died in 2023 from fentanyl. Fentanyl is one of the additives that they're putting in the drugs. Uh, heroin or what have you. And the stuff kills. It's, I understand it's very potent. So 107 plus thousand people have died. And it's getting to the place where people are encouraged to have this pen that you can jab into a person to get them to revive if they OD'd on a fentanyl. It, it's, a, it's a horrific uh, I'm looking for the word um, you know, like if you get a disease that runs rampant. What's the word I'm looking for, Jim? And endemic, pandemic, yes. Yes. It, it is horrific. And I mean, if you, don't, if, if you don't turn on the radio or read the newspapers, you might not hear it. But I mean, pastor's done many a, many a funeral in the 18 years that he's been pastor here. And I guarantee you, it's, Quite a few of them have been because of drugs, including my own daughter. But she's up in heaven, and I, I, I'm encouraged by that. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, so let's see. Southern Maryland Christian Academy, uh, the school fellowship church, you know, in, in part with one another, I'm praying God's blessings along with Pastor Marvin. To all the staff members, like I'm going to name Matthew Gaines, his family and his staff, the teachers, uh, right down to the maintenance personnel, we're praying God's blessing for 2024, that they continue, and it is a ministry. The Gaines have been involved in this ministry. I met them, I think it was 1991, when they were moving over to this property from over to... Uh, Bannister neighborhood where they were renting a, a building there. And uh, 
long, long time. And you know, it's, they, they weren't after to become millionaires. And uh, Stan Gaines has, has gone on to the Lord and uh, uh, Colleen is retired and Matthew is running the show. So God's continued blessing on him and his brother Andrew, Matthew's wife. I can't think of Matthew's wife's name. She's a nurse here. Jen, is it? Matthew, Matthew Gaines' wife? Huh? Okay, Jen, I think so. Lord, they have been a blessing to many, many a person. Many, many families, moms and dads and, and kids that have graduated from, from fellowship from Southern Maryland Christian Academy. And Fellowship Church, <laughs> I was just telling, uh, was I was talking to my sister Marie. I said, you know, I met Pastor Marvin at Tuesday night live Bible study in his house in 99. And uh, I don't want to jump off on the rabbit trail about he was telling us that he was coming up here to be interviewed to be the preacher. Two weeks later, he came back for the second interview. And then he says, well, I've got the job. <laughs> and that was 18 years ago. And praise God, and, and you know, it's about that time, so he was retired from his auto body shop where he owned and operated the place for 30 years. <coughs> and I saw him a couple times down the shop. And what I'm saying to you, when that man retired, he got 10 times, literally 10 times as busy as he ever was in that body shop. Because he's, he's doing weddings, he's doing funerals, he's doing visitation. He's going up to the hospitals in Washington, D.C. to visit folk. Uh, he's just been true and, and faithful through all the years, um, being a true servant of God, and, and, and I love him dearly myself. <laughs> love you, Marvin, if you're listening. <laughs> Praise God. So uh, one of the names that I'm thinking of on the list is Caitlin Bailey, and, and his name, you know, his situation comes close to me because he's incarcerated and I don't know quite what his sentence is or how long he's got to be. Actually, I understand that he's a federal prisoner and federal prisons do not have parole anymore. I don't know if that works out to where they don't get a smaller sentence or they can work off 20 days a month. I don't know. But uh, there have been some testimonies and even my own when I was incarcerated, that God has gotten people out of jail when he wanted them out of jail, regardless of the sentencing that the judge did. So I pray God's mercy on Caleb Bailey that he can be released earlier than the time of his sentence. And it's be the same thing as well for Cindy Levering, who, who shared a room with my daughter Mary when she was there in Jessup. Cindy is doing life without parole. Cindy says she's innocent and makes another mind to me as between her and God. Nevertheless, I think she's been incarcerated for probably 20 years or and a little and a few. But uh, she, according to the courts, will not see freedom this side of glory. And she is a born again Christian. And then there is Michelle Park. Uh, I think she's got three years left of an eight year sentence for manslaughter, drunk driving. Okay, so you all say, well, that's good for her. Mothers against drunk drivers say, well, you know, they should face the consequences. And okay, but this God also knows mercy. And, you know, if you've got any sympathy, godly sympathy, Michelle had her son in the car at the time of the accident while she was drunk. And Michelle's son has been paralyzed since. And Michelle's mom has been taking care of him. I don't know, can't think of his first name. But I'm praying God's healing to that young man's body and not thinking he's probably in his early teens now. And God is able. He's still in the healing business. And Michelle, I believe, is in her mid-30s. So she's got a lot of living to do yet. And, you know, she's going to be stepping out of prison, oh, you know, in a few years one way or another. And I pray God go out before her leader, guide her, where he would have her to go. And she's a born again Christian as well. Uh, and while Michelle Park and while Cindy Levering and while Caleb Bailey are in prisons, 
that God would use them and use them mightily as a witness to others who have no hope. It's a miserable time and place in life, being in prison away from your home, your family, and especially when you don't know how long you're going to be there. I, I, I can attest to that for a short period of time because waiting to go to court, and again, I'm going to stay away from that rabbit trail. But let's see, on my list for that, I think that covers everything that I came up on my list. So we're going to go into prayer. Thank you and praise your God, calling us to prayer, hearing us, and moving mightily here at Fellowship Church, Southern Maryland Christian Academy, uh, all who are involved in this ministry, including Bill Heath and his family. We thank you and praise you, Lord. We pray your blessing on his message to us tonight. In Jesus' name, Bill. changes. God never changes. But who changes? Mankind. And he's given us a change, a chance to change. I want to start out with a word of prayer for uh, one of the judges we'll study tonight. His name is Japheth. And it's in Judges chapter 11 and 12. So if you have your Bibles or you're just going to listen, we'll be talking about this man's life and what it means to us today. Lord God, we bring ourselves before you as you are there, the one, the true God that is in heaven, that is there. There's many gods in this world, but they're little gods and they're false gods. We thank you that for your son, Jesus Christ, his birth, his life, his death and resurrection, that we can come before your presence. We can call upon you, even as Japheth did. As we look at his story, his beginnings, his vow, and his victories. So we give this service, this message, the rest of this evening to you. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, amen. As we continue this series, it's really based on faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, mentions a whole list of honorable people of faith in God's eyes, not in man's eyes. It's a whole lot different when we realize these are the ones that God himself recognized, as we may recognize a whole different set of people. In chapter 11, verse 32, it mentions four of several judges. This is about 1200 B.C. Called the period of judges and the book of judges. It's almost like a little dispensation because they have just finished victory in the book of Joshua, a book of victory, and now they're going into Joshua's brother was the first judge in that chapter 1. And to these judges, it's a time where they went away from God, as God's people, and he would deliver them raise up a person that would be a military leader plus a judge and more military leader but the time of judges and these four are Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Japheth. We started with Barak, the battle winner. If there's any of the judges I'd like to imitate or really follow after, it's going to be Barak. 
and just the victory and how that happened in chapters 4 and 5. Then we covered Samson, a great mighty man, a strong man. He had a gift from birth. He was raised in a great family. His parents cared for him. They wanted them to obey the law, to uh, marry the right person. He had a lot going for him from his birth. And I bring that out because this person today, Japheth, is the opposite. And we'll get that in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Is God brings us through a variety of circumstances is we're all unique and different. But God, the same God is working in all of us. Now Japheth, the Gileadite, which means he is from Gilead and the Gileadites, which was a part of Manasseh on the east side of the Jordan River. Gilead. He was a mighty man of valor, courage. And then it's going to go into his beginnings, his past, the second part of verse 1. And he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead, his father, begat Japheth. And Gilead's wife bare him sons. So he had more sons from his real wife, not from a harlot. So we know he had three sons, Gilead. And Gilead's sons, wait, excuse me, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Japheth and said to him, You should not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. So he had an unfaithful father. He had a mother that didn't want him, and brothers that were unfair and cast him out with his parents' permission. So was his beginning good? Could he go back? What did he do with the way he began? We're going to see. Because he wasn't looking at his past and saying, oh, me or my, my past. He's going to make do very well with the circumstances he was dealt with from birth. From conception, I would say, not just birth. The same as Samson. From conception, when life begins. Then Japheth fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. It's a little map on the handout. He went up and right, further away from the main area where he was growing up at, but still near what you call Manasseh, East Manasseh. What happened when he dwelt in Tob? There were gathered to him vain men. Vain. What does that mean, vain men? That they were worthless in the eyes of society in that time. They didn't have value. Why? We, we doesn't tell us why, but Maybe they weren't raised right. They wanted to do their own thing. But they were coming to Japheth. And why to him? Well, he must have had some leadership abilities. He must have had something that drawn these men. And we can compare him to King David in chapter one of chapter 22 of 1 Samuel. Men that were under distress for various reasons. They were outcast. They were drawn to King David when he was fleeing from the government, from the leadership of the nation. Similar yet different situations. But these two men, Japheth and David, were men of courage and bravery. And that draws others, no matter what the situation, when they see someone that has bravery and courage to stand up 
for themselves and for others to do what's fair and to, to provide a leadership to them. And they went out with him. You could see during his teenage years, maybe he's in his early 20s, but over time, verse 4, it came to pass in the process of time. So we can see many years have passed, the process of time, to verse 4. What happened? The children of Ammon made war against Israel. Who are the children of Ammon? They are not part of the nation Israel, but still their relatives. Ammon and Moab are the Moabites and Ammonites who are the children of Lot, his two daughters. And they later became enemies of Israel. Sometimes they were friends, but they were very close. But they didn't let Israel enter into the promised land through their territory earlier in the book of Deuteronomy. So they have a history that he's going to tell us about because he knows what the law of Moses says about the Jews' history. Jehoshaphat, I mean not Jehoshaphat, <laughs> J J P A T, J E P. He knows what the Bible says, and that's part of his leadership. He knows what it says, and he can say it. And he goes back to history knowing what the Bible says because someone comes up and says, and that someone is the Ammonites, this isn't true. This is what history says. We own that land. You need to give it back to us. But he's going to tell them what the Bible says, what the law of Moses says, not what their imagination says, not what their revisionists of history, revising history, not going back as far as you should. We see the same today with American history, with Israel's history. And we'll look at that as we go through this chapter 11 of Judges. So as he was in trouble sometimes, the enemies coming to attack that were very strong and God raised him up, the elders of Gilead, the mature, the older leaders of Gilead, they went to him, and I'm going to summarize the verses here up to verse 11. And they said, will you come and help us? Because we know that you have a group of men that can be strong in battle, that can defend us. And he says to them, the leaders, well, if you accept me back, you rejected me in the past. If you accept me and make me your leader, I will come and defend you against the enemy. He knew where he stood. He knew his abilities and the past. He dealt with the past very effectively. And what did they say? Verse 10. The elders of Gilead said to Japheth, The Lord be witness between us. That was honor when you can talk with somebody and say, The Lord be a witness between us, you and I. doesn't need a piece of paper with a signature. It's our words, and they kept to their words. So the Lord's a witness of our words at this time, but really in all times. He witnesses every word, but especially in sometimes are more important our words, what we say, than other times. But all the time our words are, are important that they're right words, they're acceptable words. They're words that 
bring glory to God by truth, by honesty, by doing what's right and saying what's right to others, about others. But continuing that, he's going to say a prayer in verse 11. He went to the elders and all the people made him head and captain over them. And Japheth uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. So what they just talked about and all that he thought about it, he spoke before the Lord. He prayed. He knew that the Lord worked out his past life to bring it to what it is now and put him where he is now. It was the Lord's doing, not his own. Amen? You know, we've been bought with a price. We look at one man, various judges or people in the Old Testament. We look at the nation Israel. But today, we have all been purchased with a price. The price of the blood of Christ on the cross. The price that we don't need to sell ourselves. We've been bought with the price if you're in Christ. If you have repented and believed with your whole heart, where God sees our hearts, that new life in Christ, we've been purchased. And we don't need to sell our lives to this world, to our, our own ways no more. Our lives are His. He's purchased us. So he could understand this in his prayer where God had brought him to at this time. Verses 1 through 11. Japheth was rejected, then he leads the rejects. Let's see verses 12 to 40, chapter 11. He has two enemies he's going to deal with in the rest of the story of Japheth. The external enemy, the enemy from other nations. And then victories. Let's look at the first one. Verses 12 to 40, going to cover this. First, how he dealt with the enemy. Verse 12. And Japheth sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me, that thou art come against me to fight in my land? The battle was about the land. Property, possessions. Have you been in any battles for land, for property, for possessions in this world, in this life? If you have, you can use the principles that God does through Japheth in your own life that we're going to see. Verse 13. And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messenger of Japheth, Because Israel took away my land. Now he's saying that Israel took away his land, the enemy. Who took whose land? When? That's important to understand. And who gave them that land to begin with? Either one of them. Who gave it? Who took it away? Who gave us what we have, and who can take it away? Well, the one God, the true God, the creator God, can do both. And that's whom we know, and that's whom Japheth knew. And he knew the history behind his own life, the history behind his nation, about this property, this land. Now, who took away the land? When they came out of Egypt, going back to the book of the Deuteronomy or Exodus even, and going through the wilderness 40 years, but when they're ready to go cross into the Jordan, about this time, they're coming up from the wilderness. And he's saying, restore these lands again peacefully. Well, he wanted Israel to give back the land with peace. Just give it back to me. No conditions. We won't fight you. 
We won't battle you. We won't argue. We won't harm you. Just, we want peace. Give it back to us. Sounds pretty uh, easy, doesn't it? Yes. To the one that wants a land that's not his presently, it's easy. But let, what does Japheth say? Starting verse 14. He sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon. And he tells them the history. And up to verse 21, the people of the Amorites withstood Moses from going in. And they said, you cannot pass our land. Because Moses wanted to go through Moab and Ammon. I mean, yes, the Ammonites and the Moabites. But God said, don't battle with them. They're your cousins, relatives even, family. Although not part of the 12 tribes because that was before the 12 tribes with Lot back in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham. And then he went to go through the Amorites. They said, no, you can't go through us. And they didn't trust Israel, and they made an army in a battle to kill them. And what did God do with Joshua? He helped them have victory over the Amorites. Verse 21. But Sihon, I'll start with 20, trusted not Israel to pass through his coast. But Sihon gathered all his people together and pitched in Zahas and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel. And they smote them. Again in verse 23. For now the Lord God of Israel dispossessed the Amorites, from before his people Israel. And should if you possess, he's telling them, this land, God gave it to Israel. Because they wouldn't let them go through peacefully. We're going to attack them. And God defended his people. Will God defend us today as his people when we're up against an enemy? Yes, he does. But we have to be in his hand, in his will, in the time and place. Verse 24. And what happened? He says in the letter to the king that wants to come in and battle against Israel, will thou not, will not you possess that which Chemosh, Chemosh thy God, giveth thee to possess? Back then they think, your God is the one that gave you Chemosh. He gives you what you win in battle. They gave the victory to their gods. They said, well, if your God gave you that victory, our God gave us our victory. And whoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, that we possess. So lands and properties, possessions change hands over time. God delivered them from the true God, from their false God, 300 years ago. And where does that talk about? Verse 26. He's talking about 300 years ago. Many generations have passed as we're dealing with a nation and a nation's history. Verse 26. Wherefore, I have not sinned against you, but thou hast doest me wrong to war against me. Because God gave him the victory, and he's coming in to claim something that's not his. The sin is not with Japheth. The sin is the ones that are coming to claim the land that's not rightfully theirs and given to them by God 300 years ago. What is that like today? When we go to Israel and see the war since October 7th or 8th, October 7th, with the Hamas, but also with the Palestinians, with up north, the Syrians, the Hezbollah. This is all part of a spiritual warfare that things that happen thousands of years ago, 
not just since 1948 and the United Nations gave the land back. This has been happening back and forth, this land, thousands of years ago, not just 300 years. But going in the past, we got to look way back. Because we go back to the creation, God the Creator, about 6,000 years ago, a little more. He had a purpose and a plan, and he brought the nation Israel for his purpose and plan to bring forth his son, Jesus Christ, from a specific group of people that would be the Savior to the world, to the Gentiles, to all nations. However, we're still looking at the Old Testament. It was one nation he was working through with one God because all the nations that were there before had other gods and false gods. What happened after Japheth? He says, The king of the children of Ammon hearkened not to the words of Japheth. He spoke his words and he didn't listen. So when a servant of God speaks words and they're walking with the Lord, words are powerful. And the words that are said will have an effect that is undesirable to some and desirable to others. There's power in words. And as we obey the Lord and follow and walk in the steps of Jesus according to his plan, his will, our words have power and effect with others. The same as Japheth did. Then, verse 29, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Japheth. Then the Spirit of the Lord. He didn't have the Spirit of the Lord until after he said what was right, what was true, what was history. And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. As the Spirit of the Lord came upon people at different times in the Old Testament. Today the Spirit of the Lord will come comes upon us as in Acts 2 and dwells within us and grows within us. The Holy Spirit. That's the greater blessings we have today in the New Testament. And we can proclaim the wonderful works of God is in Acts 2. This is part of the wonderful works. Then he made a vow. Well, wow, time is flying. <laughs> and he said, the first thing that comes out of your house, I'll make a sacrifice to the Lord. Then he won the victory, and he came back, and his daughter walked out. It was his only daughter. The love of a father with his only daughter. And he was grieved and tore his clothes. And his daughter said, you've opened your mouth to a vow to the Lord and he gave you victory. She loved him too. And said, let me go meet my friends for two months and wail my virginity that I will not give you a son. I will not give you an inheritance. And that was a sacrifice she had with her father's vow. So unnecessary vows, promises to God, have consequences. Sometimes vows are, we do, should make vows, and sometimes not. This is approaching the new year. If you make a vow, do it very carefully. We can do it to our own hurt or shame because we don't keep it. So think, pray, Lord, what would you have me vow to you? And then chapter 12, the internal enemy, his own brother from the tribe of Ephraim raises up against him. Why? Because he was jealous. He was jealous that after the victory is won, he said, why didn't you call me to go battle with you? And then he said, because, verse 1, because you have not called me, we will burn down your house with fire. 
Does that sound like a brother? Well, <laughs> it was a jealous brother. Jealousy, bitterness. And Japheth got upset with him. The Ephraimites. And later on, just in that battle, when they were returning to go back to their land, they decided, we can't win this man and his army. When they went across the Jordan River, they asked him, can you say this word? And where is it? Shibboleth. But they couldn't say the H. They said Sibboleth. And what happened? He slew 24,000 of them. That was a lot. <laughs> but they were like Cain and Abel. Brothers can be your worst enemies. And your own people of the, the Jews, as Korah, was in, against Moses. Balaam, he didn't attack the Jews. He told them, intermarry, that you will go after other gods. Back in the book of Balaam in Numbers 22 to 24. So they were going to attack. So Jabeth tells them, you're, you're doing evil. And he ends up winning that battle too. Over his own brothers from the tribe of Ephraim. So that finishes Japheth. The lessons we can learn from this judge that was a, a great leader. And may we find, we pray for, who's our great leader here for this church? Pastor Marvin Harris. And those that, I pray there's to be more of a leader next year as Japheth, is courage. And that comes through knowing the word and knowing God's will for your life. As men, we can know his will. We don't have to be, hope it is, or his high calling. That is what I would say we can learn from this lesson is the last lesson before Sunday as we gather together on New Year's Eve, the last Sunday of the year, looking for the new year, planning ahead, but more so that we're letting God to prepare our hearts first for what's ahead to enter this new year is a victorious year for him, for his glory. And I'll finish with that. Pray these, speak these things, Lord. You be with each of these men, the ones that are listening on YouTube, and planning, preparing for the new year in our hearts, Lord. And that's what matters to you. In a pure heart, not just because our hearts, but a pure heart that's purified by the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ from seeking you and desiring your will to your glory. Amen.